Good morning. I'm Brian Nelson, Director of Institutional Advancement at Dunwoody College of Technology. Welcome to our October Lead Speaker Series. First, I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. I want to remind you that all attendees are in listen and view only mode, which means you will not be able to activate your webcam or microphone. You may use a chat feature to post questions for the Q&A session after the presentation. October is National Cybersecurity Month, so it's only fitting that we have our speaker with us this morning. It's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce a great friend to Dunwoody, Mike Walbrink. Mike will be giving a presentation on cybersecurity is everybody's problem. He will give an all-encompassing look at why effective cybersecurity involves everyone, not just IT professionals. Mike is the president of Azul, the largest service-disabled veteran-owned business staffing company in Minnesota. In business for just eight years, Azul has been recognized by the Business Journal as one of the top 25 veteran-owned companies seven years in a row. Dedicated to putting veterans to work, the team at Azul has been recognized for their business ethics by the Better Business Bureau, honored as a 2016 SBA Veteran Business of the Year, Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year finalist, and the Minnesota Business Community Impact Award, and in 2015 was awarded a grant from J.P. Morgan Chase to start Azul Cyber, which has placed dozens of veterans in cybersecurity positions. Azul was awarded the Disabled Veteran-Owned Business Certificate in 2013, which permits the company to provide sole source solutions to government prime contractors. The distinction leads to new opportunities placing veterans and non-veterans alike with a current focus on IT and project management. Mike is an Airborne Ranger who served in multiple combat tours with the 82nd Airborne Division and also is the aide for the general developing the Star Wars technology. Mike also served in the U.S. Army Reserve. Mike has a bachelor degree in psychology from Wheaton College, and in his spare time, he serves as the head of Azul Foundation and serves as employer of choice for Christian Businessmen's Connection in Minnesota. He is also a credentialed pastor and has been frequently spotted baptizing Minnesota legislators in the Jordan River in Israel. Mike is married and lives with his wife and children in Lakeville, Minnesota. Please give a warm welcome to Mike Walbrink. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, the lead presentation that uh, Dunwoody has this morning. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about cybersecurity. We're going to talk a little bit about who we can trust and uh, a little bit why about why it takes everyone, not just IT professionals. This is not going to be a deep dive into denial of service attacks. It's going to be a higher level overview and talk a little bit about some things we normally don't uh, think about as far as cybersecurity and risk. First thing I'd like to do is thank Dunwoody uh, for this opportunity. Dunwoody has a really long and uh, prestigious uh, reputation for supporting veterans and uh, our nation. Uh, it was established in 1914 from the estate of William Hood Dunwoody. He was an entrepreneur in the milling business. Throughout World War I and II, they trained hundreds and thousands, hundreds and thousands, not hundreds of thousands, of men and women uh, to defend the US. The men were trained to go off to the war and the women were trained in manufacturing, welding, and construction to fill the gaps the men left behind. After the wars, Dunwoody played a significant role in training veterans in their role uh, return to civilian life. Many companies were founded, including Weiss Builders, Mortensen Construction, Frannick Construction, and other giants in their industries. Uh, I really found it uh, fun and interesting when Don Fish sent me the following uh, pictures. You can see on the screen, uh, the artisan features the Naval Flight Officer School, and on the left-hand side is a picture of their faculty um, from the 1918, I believe it is. And they also had a uh, sailing department and other departments that we just wouldn't have thought about being uh, supported here in uh, in Minnesota. The other thing that Dunwoody does a great job is supporting uh, women um, through their uh, Kate Dunwoody Society. The Kate Dunwoody Society is coming up in November, and if you haven't registered, I would encourage you to do so. It's a great, uh, great event and a great fundraiser for them. And this event is held in recognition of the vision and generosity of Kate Dunwoody. She understood the need to provide that extra leg up for women facing challenges and forging unprecedented paths to accomplish this. 
The Kate Dunwoody Society virtual event helps secure that first rung by raising scholarships for women going into technical fields where there are often significant barriers to entry. The event helps fund um, these scholarships in honor of their namesake. And last year, the Kate Dunwoody Society helped nine women achieve their dreams by providing needed scholarship support. That's just outstanding. I happen to know General Horvath. Uh, she's a phenomenal lady, really understands cyber and what it takes to, uh, to make it going forward. And, um, and I encourage you to sign up because she's gonna do a phenomenal job. So as we shift over to the cyber conversation, we really need to talk a little bit about what is cyber, when did it begin, and how long has this thing been around? Well, the creeper virus was actually the first virus that is most commonly recognized. Back in 1971, it was created as an experimental self-duplication program. A lot of viruses self-duplicate on different machines that was intended not to inflict damage, but to illustrate the application. Um, it went after corrupt computers and then would start printing something and then stop. And the message could come up, I'm the creeper, catch me if you can. A little bit jovial to begin with, but it really showed the um, ability to get into and penetrate other computer networks even way back then. We jump forward a little bit farther and we look at the DEF CON conference. DEF CON started in 1993 by Jeff Moss. There were about 100 people that attended that conference in Las Vegas. And today the conference is attended by well over 20,000 people. Cybersecurity for um, cybersecurity officials from across the world, including our uh, three-letter agencies, including the FBI. Also anonymous, uh, the quasi uh, socials first hacking group started in uh, 2003. Um, it's known for its decentralized international activists and hacktivist movement um, for various attacks against uh, governments, institutions agencies and including the Church of Scientology. So they really kind of look at things and attack things that they think aren't headed in the right direction socially. So very interesting all the way back to 2003 and they've been active even this last year. So then we have to step up and say, okay, that's great history, but what's really included in cyber and cybersecurity? Well, on the screen, you can see that we have things like malware and phishing that we've heard about. Um, we've heard about password attacks. Some of you have heard about denial of service attacks. Um, we talk, We heard about rogue software. It seems like every month you get um, uh, an, an email notifying you that one of the apps on your phone might be bad or something along those lines. But really, where do we dig into this? According to Cisco, cybersecurity is the practice of protecting systems, networks, and programs from digital attacks. These cyber attacks are usually aimed at accessing, changing, or destroying sensitive information extorting money from users or interrupting normal business processes. So it really is coming against all of the different electronic things that we have going and how can people disrupt those things. We've heard about a lot of these things. We're gonna talk about a couple of them here in a, little, in a little bit. When we look at maps like this, sometimes we're watching the news and somebody will pop up a map like this. And we see all these uh, dashes and we see all these strikes going across the world. You know, they make for great movies, but truly in the, in the real world side of things, how concerned do I have to be? Should I really care or should I just leave this up to, uh, up to Hollywood and be able to um, uh, rest easily at night? Well, when we come to practical things that affect a lot of us, the headlines are truly full of data breaches. We see these things all the time. It seems like you can't go a week without saying somebody's database got hacked. Um, last year we had Facebook a couple of different times and if you look 450 million users, excuse me, 540 million users, that is a lot of people, um, you know, more than the population of the US that had their identities and names and pass passwords um, taken. And so you start to look at some of these things. Well, what does that really mean? Because the average consumer gets a notification, you know, every three or four months, it seems like saying, hey, you've been attacked, your information's been compromised, different things are going on, what's, what's really happening here? You get an offer for a free identity protection service, but at the end, nothing really seems to have changed. You can probably, you know, if you talk to your friends and acquaintances, find somebody that's had their identity stolen. Um, they went through a lot of um, problems to get it back. Um, a lot of you know people who've had their Facebook uh, accounts compromised, but long-term uh, long problems with that are really not that big generally. So what does this really look like? And you know, quite honestly, 
I want my life to be convenient. So why should I really worry? Why should I care? We look at our smart homes and almost everything in your home now can be controlled by the internet, by the internet of things, IOT. You know, we can have our TVs, certainly washers and dryers. You can have a TV on your refrigerator, uh, thermostats and all the security cameras um, and everything else like that can be controlled by an app on your phone. Everything is wireless and, and it's all out there. Why should I worry? What's really interesting because last weekend um, I went up north for my anniversary with my uh, my best friend, my wife Jody, and on the way back, our five-month-old puppy, that's uh, Gidget there in the picture, um, and it's not live, it's, uh, she never stays still that long, um, but we had stopped at a gas station to uh, to fill up the, the gas tank and to, to empty the dogs, and she was out um, just walking around like puppies ought to do. And um, pretty soon she was just face planting. So she put her face and she's just trying to rub her eye through the grass. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? Well, she had picked up an infection in her left eye. And um, about five minutes after this, her eye was really swollen. It looks like she had lost a prize fight. And so we immediately gave her, Jody gave her Benadryl and uh, we started making phone calls to vets and saying, okay, what can, we, uh, what can we do about this? Is there a way we can get in? I was concerned that it was a chemical. I didn't want anything to damage her eye. And, um, and so we had to be able to get in. You know, it wasn't four hours after that before ads like this started showing up on my Facebook feed. You can't call a veteran. You can't give Benadryl. You can't do these things without phones and everything else listening to your accounts. Just happened last weekend. So we really have to start to say, okay, why should I worry? how much care do I really want to, um, uh, to put into this um, when truly everything around us uh, is listening, everything around us is um, a security risk, and the people that are designing, for example, your um, automatic vacuum cleaner, Roomba or something along those lines, um, you know, they're much more concerned about the quality of service that particular device is providing than they are the security in most cases. Um, you can ha um, run a hack through somebody's coffee pot. Uh, quite a few, or just a, about two years ago, there was a tremendous denial of service attack, and that was all run off of the DVR recorders on different people's cable machines or cable systems. So there's a lot of things that are out there, and you just wouldn't expect that all of them can potentially be used by hackers, but they are um, they're very, very exposed. Um, last year, uh, my kids got some of the LED... Uh, uh, lights for their bedrooms. Well, I was great with that because I want the kids to be able to express themselves and decorate their bedrooms however they want. I think this last weekend, my daughter painted cow stripes on the bedroom and things. I think that that's awesome. But when the LED light wants to connect to our wireless and that then wants to connect to a server in China, I'm a little bit concerned. Everything has um, the potential for some nefarious activity and we really have to be concerned about this. So I did not let them connect those parts of things, um, but the cow stripes are up there and, and I think that that's an awesome thing. So we really have to be careful about what we do with this. So we can also go too far with this, okay? Because then we get locked up and things just aren't um, able to be communicated effectively. And we spend all our time with security and we actually can't function. So we have to think about, okay, how far is too far and what do we actually do in these cases? And that raises a little bit bigger question. Whose responsibility is it when we look at cyber and cybersecurity? Okay, we've had a really interesting wake up call in 2020 because we have another virus that's on the scene. And when we talk about presenting, preventing a virus, we all have now been trained in, you know, wearing a mask, covering your mouth, washing your hands, doing all these things that we're supposed to be doing. The signs are everywhere. And we have to look and say, okay, who's responsible for preventing this virus? If we happen to get COVID-19, whose fault is that? Okay, well, we could ultimately go back and say it's China's fault, but in our particular individual sphere of influence, where is that? We really can't blame your doctor if, um, if you get uh, the coronavirus. And if your doctor isn't responsible for that, can you blame your IT department for you getting a virus on your system? Okay, it's really time that we looked at this a little bit differently and we have to change our planning around things that um, 
the public can understand. And leadership has to really step in and say, okay, we have to look at this a little bit differently. This becomes a little bit more of a personal responsibility. We won't get into which virus is more dangerous. That's a whole nother subject. And, um, and we won't get into which economic impact is more significant because that could be a whole nother subject as well. When we look at this, we have to say, okay, how do we help people do this, okay? Beginning of coronavirus, people were all about stockpiling things. Well, people are not gonna do backups of their computers all over the place. It's just not gonna be the same thing. A lot of that has to do with personal impact and it has to do with how they're affected by the particular virus. Because if there's no long-term impact um, of the virus on their computer, then it really doesn't matter to them. Uh, if they get sick with Corona or COVID-19, then it's like, okay, this is this is really affecting me personally. So this is something that leadership really needs to look at it uh, in, a, in a different format than we have in the past. It's not an IT problem. As we move forward, then we personally can say, okay, how can I protect my various circles as we struggle with whose responsibility is this? Who is my responsibility? It's me, it's my family, my business, my friends, and then how far does that extend? What is your calling? Um, you know, my dad spent a, a tremendous amount of time supporting uh, the church that I grew up in. Um, he's just a pillar of the community and he spends a lot of time, he would absolutely say that his church is part of the calling to, uh, to support from protection. But in cyber, that's a great question. He can't be responsible for what the secretary at the church clicks on. So we really have to look at this a little bit differently. We have to remember that in our circles of influence, those are wonderful, but we can't ever chase anybody to help them. They'll end up saying, hey, these guys are crying wolf again. You know, you can help them, save them one or twice, but then after that, um, it just doesn't lead to responsible behavior on their part. So it really is a personal accountability thing in, um, in these cases. So then the question becomes, Oops, how can I, who can I trust? Who can I bring into this? Because it seems like every day, it seems like every week, there's another new super missile that's been developed, a silver bullet that should come in and clean off your computer, protect you forever and, uh, and everything else like that. And it just doesn't work that way. You know, we have to get into the second or third round of, uh, of software releases before they get the bugs out. We have to get into, um, you know, some real world testing and some real world um, bug development and, and resolution before things can be effective. Um, I'd encourage you to lean on local people, known groups, uh, friends that you have out there that have actual real world experience in various pieces of software uh, and things like that. We talk about national organizations, we talk about you know McAfee, we can talk about um, all of the different uh, other organizations and, and Norton and, and these well-known names those are organizations that have been there. Yes, they have buggy releases sometimes, but they turn around and they fix it and they move forward. Unknown players that come up with a brand new virus protection program, you really have to wonder about them. A year or two into it, absolutely. Take a look, see what they're really doing. Look at the reviews by professionals and see what that happens. But jumping into something brand new gets a little bit interesting. And then international friends. We've got some freak friends over in Israel that um, uh, support us tremendously and um, and, and their help is just beyond reproach, is beyond question because they are so professional in, in the way that they're putting it all together. So then we move to the next side of this and you know even the best of us could be taken by a bad apple. Um, and that's even happened personally. We had a, uh, an executive from a Fortune 500 company that came and joined our team for a little while and uh, wasn't producing, wasn't quite getting in the right direction, wasn't moving along. And uh, after a couple of months, he departed to move on to other things took a lot of our IP that we developed around staffing, around cyber, what we wanted to do, kind of walked off with it. He even created his own foundation. And so we really have to look at who you share personal data with. Another example, just this spring, uh, we were working on um, uh, some different things, working on some, um, some hacking examples, working on some penetration testing and some other things like that with a certain individual and uh, come to find out after a for short period of time, this person actually um, had active court cases going on. Um, from some nefarious things that he was doing. And um, we had to part company uh, rather abruptly. And um, uh, as of today, I believe that he has an active federal warrant out. So even though he's an Air Force vet, you still have to be very careful about um, who you're working with and um, and who you can how you can be taken advantage of. So um, vet, whoever you're working with, um, somebody a long time ago said, trust but verify. I think the Gipper was onto something and I encourage you to do the same, um, the same type of thing. Um, when you do this, I really encourage you to build a good team. 
get a good group of people that you can talk to. Focus on silos. Are you here at work? Are you at home? How does your tablet and your mobile devices interface with other things? If you're at home office, if you're working remotely, a lot of things have changed. Let's look at um, in those silos of communications, where might the weak spots be? Um, are you using Zoom? Are you using Teams? Are you using Amazon Chimes? There's a lot of different technology out there. Um, just continue to talk to people, make new friends, find out what they're using and what's working for them. The world changes very quickly, and a lot of times there could be new products out there that have been tested, they've been vetted by people that you know, and um, uh, I encourage you to uh, continually adapt to, uh, to those types of things. And then trust, but audit your team. Find out what's going on and what, um, what they're really working on, how things are effective um, in not just one area, but um, in several different areas at the same time. We have to remember phishing is the number one uh, reason that people are having issues. And this is the biggest problem because it's a picnic error. And we started laughing at picnic errors way back, you know, years and years ago when I was working at a help desk and uh, we just can't help those things. We have to be kind to our users. We have to educate our users because they are the ones that we support. Um, but also um, there are a lot of times where the, uh, the biggest issues come from. And uh, we have to find loving ways to help them learn the, uh, the more intelligent ways to, uh, to move through their systems. And then we have to prioritize our defense. Obviously, um, if budgets and time were unlimited, we could do a lot of different items. Um, in these particular cases, I would encourage you to look at your business and say, okay, what is the most important thing that's there? You know, if you're an architectural firm, your drawings, your, the things that you're working on every day, that is your uh, intellectual property. Those are your things that you really, um, you have to protect. Obviously, you know, if you're a law firm, you do not want your case files exposed to the world. Uh, if you're a manufacturer, the product designs that you have, the things that you're working on, even the nuances that you um, create and tweak with your CNC machines, those are incredibly important um, uh, to you and you don't want those lost. Um, a while ago, the Chinese were building a new aircraft carrier. And instead of going from the ground up, they do what is typical. And uh, they went out to say, okay, who's got the best designs for different things in the world? Uh, there's a company that produces the aircraft carrier elevators that move the airplanes from one deck to another. And instead of going out and designing their own, they went to the local company that was producing that elevator. They um, hacked that company, took those designs, and they now have the best functioning elevators um, uh, in the world. But that little firm designing the elevator really wasn't thinking that China would be trying to go after them. They thought, well, China would be going after United States things, right? DOD. But um, they really will go after things and reverse design them and go after the little things. Even an ice cream shop. Why would an ice cream shop be vulnerable? Well, ice cream shop happens to have a reward program. My friend, a neighbor who has a great, uh, great waffle house in, in Lakeville, um, you know, when I, I go there, um, he has his um, points that he gives us every single time that we order something there, and all of that data could then be used for something nefarious. So each business as it's out there has something that, uh, that needs to be watched. When we look at this, this is where I don't want to get into a lot of detail because uh, each one of these items could be a half hour discussion in and of itself, but uh, when was the last time you had an assessment and somebody truly from the outside look at your systems? When you act, when was the last time you had a penetration test? Somebody actually coming in and hacking your system. That doesn't have to be expensive. And it really can wake up your team if you're having trouble getting people to help you understand if this is real. We say, okay, you know what? We sit down and within a minute and a half, we can be inside your wireless network and start to pull up your servers. Um, then it's time to say, okay, how do we do this? Again, this is not meant to blame the IT department. This is meant to say, okay, we're knocking on doors and windows. Somebody's gonna leave something open and how do we get in and take a peek at it? The other thing we have to look at is your business needs to be compliant to somebody. Everybody's got a boss. So who do you report to? Well, if it's a DOD system, then you have one site. If you just are a, a vendor in a supply chain, then you have the vendors or the, the companies that are above and below you on that supply chain and they wanna know that you're compliant. So there's everybody's got a different spot and it's important to talk to them and say, okay, what do you really expect from us? and then be aware of what they're doing. Because if they give you bad parts and you pass those along, it becomes a uh, everybody's issue. Um, the other thing is we shouldn't be afraid of security. We need to take time to understand it. There's no dumb questions when it comes to this. When you, because the acronyms change all the time, there's new updates all the time. 
just take a little bit of time and say, hey, you know what? Tell me about this. Explain this to me. I don't understand this part. It happens all the time. Everybody does it. So don't be afraid of it. Don't be ashamed that you don't know. Take time to listen to it. And then these assessments leave to manage services. Somebody that's going to come in and say, okay, I can help you with these 10 or 12 different parts of what you're doing. And they should be able to explain what they're providing and each segment of what they're providing as far as virus protection or firewall or any of these other things and explain and justify the, the numbers that are behind that. So that becomes really important. Don't be afraid of this stuff. Get active in it because it can shut your business down pretty quickly. But it's really important that you, um, you do take an active role in understanding in it. It's all a balancing act. Moral of the story, we have to remember I, viruses in personal life and uh, in the business world, it's not an IT problem. It's a personal problem and you have to be able to account for it that way. New threats are coming up every single day. It's crazy when you start to see the attack maps that are out there and, and who's really um, going after whom. Cyber isn't going away. As we now have gone virtual for an awful lot of 2020, we have to realize everything we do is becoming communications and electronics, and uh, we have to get smarter and smarter as everyone else. And leadership is gonna have to do a lot different job with their messaging saying, okay, here's the audience. How do we get them spun up? How do we educate them as far as why some of these different things are important and what we're getting ready to do to protect the business? Couldn't leave without a shout out to some of our friends. We'll just leave this for a moment so you can appreciate that. I'm not saying there's any predictions about playoffs coming up. And there we go forward. Thank you very much. My name is Mike Wolbrink and I'm happy to help you with any of these questions. My contact information is on the screen and I'm gonna turn this back over to Brian. Great, Mike, thanks for your insights. And it's scary to think about how people are probing our systems and looking at our personal data. <clears throat> we do have a, um, a question here. Um, can you give us some best practices around managing passwords and how can somebody um, keep track of that so that there's an, um, we're tracking through our passwords? Absolutely, there's several different ways to do this. Uh, passwords are something that you need to change frequently and often. Um, and we don't want all of our passwords to be the same. There's a couple of different ways. Um, your browser will offer to save your passwords for you. Um, if you're not doing a lot of secure things, there are different people that use this on a regular basis. Um, each one has it, Edge has it, and Chrome has it, and some of the, you know, Firefox. And, but, um, so that that is certainly an option. Um, I would encourage you to use actually some of the password managers that are out there. Um, look at some of the experienced ones. You may have one that's even offered with your identity protection program, which I encourage you to have um, and, and sign up for that. Experiment a little bit with it. Find one that um, makes it easy, but also um, uh, has a really good reputation for maintaining their security because there's you know hundreds of places we have to maintain passwords for. You can't remember them all. You don't want to write them down in your desk, but you do need to uh, to change them frequently. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. And then well, what's the biggest challenges facing American businesses today in the current cybersecurity environment? I think it's actually it's the unknown. They don't know what's going on next, and they really don't know uh, who to trust in a lot of cases. Um, as we look at uh, the initial lockdown that happened back in March, uh, Zoom is a great example of that. Um, you know, Zoom came out as the first solution for everybody, and everybody said, "Let's go to Zoom." Well. Pretty soon we found that there were four or seven or 15 or a dozen different cybersecurity holes in Zoom and people started jumping into conversations um, with uh, uh, inappropriate comments and inappropriate photos and everything else like that. And if you have a school that's using Zoom, um, that can be really a, a significant problem. Zoom turned around and patched their systems and fixed their systems and they actually got it resolved. So the unknown of which systems you can trust, who can you move forward with, you really have to look at the reputation that the, uh, the product has in the community. And there's reviews on this stuff all over the place. Not just the Amazon reviews that you see, you know, one or two sentences, but, um, you know, Wired and CNET and a lot of these other ones, there's a lot of dark web uh, magazines out there that, not magazines, but um, uh, websites out there that talk about the dark web, but they also talk about hacking and they talk about various products and how open they are to, um, uh, to being hacked. There's some uh, great um, higher level cyber intelligence products there as well. We've got friends over at Kayla that provide outstanding uh, dark web intelligence um, that, that can tell you what's for sale on the dark web 
and whether or not your suppliers have been hacked. So it really depends uh, on how deep you want to dig into that. Great. And then, Mike, a lot of our things are linked. You have your, your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your, your PC, everything's tied together. Are there some simple just best practices on whether they should be linked or not linked, or how do we best protect ourselves from a cyber attack? Yeah, great question. The best way that you can protect yourself in those cases is do the updates. Um, when your tablet, if you are a Samsung guy, your tablet is hooked to your phone, is hooked to your PC, and if you're a Apple person, you know, your phone and your watch and everything is all connected. And um, the best way to do that is just by maintaining the current uh, the current updates. When we go in for a penetration test, we go in to uh, do some of these other things. Most of the time, the vulnerabilities that we find are due to lack of patching. And so when your system says, hey, there's an update, do you want to do it now or later? Don't put it off. Do it now, even if it's your watch, if it's, you know, your phone systems, everything like that. Keep those patches current. In the in the current environment, you're, you're going to find that, you know, 5 to 10, maybe 15% of the patches were rushed and they don't come out quite right. That's going to happen. And uh, Microsoft, uh, this happens to them every Tuesday. They release a big patch and something goes sideways. Um, have patience with that. Next Tuesday's patch or an interim patch will fix them. But really, um, Brian, the best way to fix those is patches. Great. And then we have a couple questions that have come in off up over the line here. Are there specific settings on our phone that we should turn on or turn off that will protect us from them listening to us? You know, that really comes down to um, how secure you want your life to be. Um, we were uh, on the way to the Arboretum with my grand with my parents a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I almost had to pull over because my mother did something that I'd never seen her do before. She held up her phone and she said, hey, Siri. And I didn't have any idea what to do because this was brand new for my mother. I was incredibly proud of her and um, and and she's doing a great job and recognizing that for her, her cyber risk with that phone is actually very small. If we're in a different environment where we're going to be exposed to a lot of different things, we may want to turn our microphone off. We may want to turn our Bluetooth off. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier, what's the best way to connect um, to you know, my bank account when I'm sitting in a crowded bar? Don't. You know, um, Let's turn off some of the wireless things when we come in there because, and if you just want to experiment with this and have a little bit of fun, go into a bar or restaurant or something else like that with a lot of different people and turn on your phone and search for Bluetooth devices and just see the long list of everybody's devices that show up on their on your phone. And if you wanted to click on those and try and pair with them, you could. And you'd see somebody across the, the room look at their watch and say, hey, somebody's trying to connect with me. Um, it's just everything's open. So it depends on the level of security you want to have, uh, turning off Wi-Fi, turning off Bluetooth, and then condensing that as you get into a higher risk environment. But again, it's a balance between security and convenience. Great, thank you. And what's, what's your assessment of smart speakers in terms of benefits versus security trade-offs? Again, I think that depends on what you're doing. Um, it's been a lot of fun to watch the different news articles over the summer where um, uh, Alexa and, and Google and things have been um, actually served warrants for uh, the data that they've collected at a crime scene. So these things are listening all the time. And in these particular cases, there were actually assaults or in one case, a murder that had been convicted, uh, committed, and they wanted to go back and learn what Alexa had heard uh, leading up to that murder. And so um, you can hear these things all the time. Um, in, in some of the classes that are being taught in different places, you'll have instructors that will uh, go in and show all of the different home video security systems that have been hacked. Um, there's sites out there that just show this. And so um, we don't have one of those at our house. Um, that's not something that we're going to have um, because they're listening all the time. A lot of people enjoy it. A lot of people think, you know what, the convenience of saying, hey, you know, what's the weather going to be today um, is uh, is very much worthwhile, that risk. That's something, again, comes down to individual choice and responsibility. Oh, thank you. Another question is, can you explain the following situation? I was researching a company website on my work computer, and then a day later, ads for that company um, started showing up on my personal Instagram feed on my personal iPhone. Can you explain how this happens when you're, something at work is linking over to something on my personal side and 
Is there a way to shut that off? That's a great question. It has a lot to do with all of the things, uh, the cookies and other things like that, that, that sites are using. Um, and you're going to find that uh, when someone, and a lot of times that can be Amazon, it can be Facebook, it can be you know a whole group, it can be Google, it can be just all kinds of different uh, organizations do this. They'll find that you have an interest in one item and they'll say, hey, you know what? We can actually sell to this person because I've expressed an interest in that item and it will transfer because you're using the same uh, account. Maybe you're logged in at work in your Google account and that automatically transfers over. Google moves that over to your personal devices. So that's where uh, in my illustration a little bit earlier, you know, I would find a dog allergy ad even though I'd use my phone for this, I'd use the Google search to find veterinarians and allergies that will then move over to my tablet a little bit later on because Google will say, hey, Mike's on his phone. Oh, Mike's on his tablet. Mike's on his computer. I'm just going to move the ads from one place to the other. Thanks. Um, another question is, is it better to answer spam calls or to unsubscribe from emails or to get your name removed from those lists or just ignore those calls? It seems like if you um, unsubscribe, you get 10 times as many responses back. Can you um, help with that? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of different things. Spam is just a nuisance that's out there. Um, there's reasons that uh, robocall legislation is in front of um, uh, our legislators on a regular basis. Um, I'm not sure why it hasn't passed yet. I think there's a lot of lobbying and influence on there, but um, there's a national call list. If you go Google national call list, you can put your phone numbers in there. That helps with legitimate companies. A lot of the phone calls that you're going to get are not legitimate, and you're not necessarily going to be able to stop those. Um, you have a lot of ads now that are making fun of the call warranty systems and things like that. Um, in, in our particular case, you know, you block those numbers, but those numbers are maybe one or two time use. They use it for a little while, and then they move on to something different. Um, a good spam filter for your email uh, and your junk email filter will um, will be useful. Uh, a lot of times, if it's from a known organization, you can unsubscribe um, to that and then you won't be getting any more communications from them. But in a lot of cases, they're just sending things out. And uh, if you respond back, they'll be like, oh, this is actually a valid email. Then they'll turn around and sell that list and target you even more. So using a junk email filter is usually the best way to do it. Go through it once or twice, either a day or a week, depending on how many uh, emails you get. And uh, it's just the extra noise that you have to get. It's kind of like junk email in your mailbox. Um, particularly this time of year, there's an awful lot of extra stuff that you get in there and you just have to throw it away. You can't stop it. So good. And with all the inevitable intrusions, should one think hard about going off grid and just dumping technology? You know, um, I'm in a lot of different veterans groups uh, online and about every week somebody posts a cabin up in Montana and said, you know, would you take, you know, would you live here for six months for $100,000? Everybody says yes. You know, so it's just a matter of wanting to get off and take a break from a little bit. Um, there are those that go off grid and there are those that, um, that take those breaks, but that's not really how we're wired. You know, we're a people that want to be together. We do better when we're in communication with others. It's a balancing act. It's a lot of risk. Um, if things aren't um, uh, beneficial to what you're doing, um, then, you know, remove those things from what you're, uh, you know, from your life. If you've got a lot of phone calls that are coming in um, to a particular phone number and it's all junk, you may want to change your phone number, even if you've had it for a while. Tell your friends and family that, you know what, I'm adjusting this and you can, uh, you can move on. But um, most of us want to have a balancing act somewhere between that, uh, between that and moving off completely off grid. Perfect. Thank you. Are there certain types of companies or industries that are especially at risk for cyber attacks? Well, we have to think about what organizations uh, are the quickest and best payouts for um, for the cyber attackers. So when we look at ransomware, for example, um, you don't see very many banks advertising that they get hooked by ransomware. Why? Because banks want to be secure institutions. They do get hit by ransomware, but not to the extent. You hear hospitals frequently uh, getting attacked by ransomware. You hear cities, you hear schools, and I think we're going to unfortunately see a lot more schools um, get hit by this, and then people are paying those out. The vulnerabilities that are out there are because people don't have budget. You look at a lot of schools, they don't have the ability and the budgets to lock everything down, and they don't have um, the ability to hire sometimes all of the staff that they need to uh, to make themselves as secure as possible. So 
they become a bigger attack. And the payload that the the hackers are after there are all of those names and addresses and social security numbers for all the students. That's not valid data that they can use right now. But in five years, when those students all become seniors in 18, that's a whole trove of tax returns and credit cards and everything else like that that those hackers can use. So sometimes that payload's uh, delayed a little bit, but that's, you know, you find something that's vulnerable and then you can move on. Um, and then you look at, uh, like I said earlier, things that don't have the budget to defend themselves and are more likely having insurance to, uh, to pay the ransom. Interestingly, um, I think it's 99.1% of the time when paid, the hackers release the keys and, uh, and people can continue on uh, and get unlocked after a ransomware attack. So that's a really high, um, high frequency. Well, thanks for that. What, what do you know about telephone solicitations that have caller ID? For example, it might be a health system, but they are really not legitimately that. Is it this legal or the perpetrator has not been caught? What's the, um, what do you know about that? Yeah, great question. There was a big scan that was going around a little while ago. Um, the IRS was calling people and they would use an, a caller ID spoofing program. You can actually go get those. Um, those aren't legal unless you're using it for an illegal purpose. So I could call you, say I was the FBI and wish you happy birthday. You know, that's really not illegal. It would be illegal for me to call you and try and extort something saying that it was the FBI and that that side of things. Now, that's the generally accepted. Don't go out and do that and say that Mike said it was OK. That's not the case. But um, a lot of times you can use the caller ID spoofing and go from there. In this particular scam, people were using the out caller ID. It would say the IRS and they would ask you to go out and get an Apple ID gift card or an Apple gift card and pay your taxes uh, with an Apple gift card. Well, this happened to be uh, a firm over in India and I think they arrested, it's like 300 people and, um, and shut down a really big call center that had been um, calling all kinds of folks. But just because it says that it's that on the ID, it's easy to spoof. Um, you can probably ask a uh, junior in high school, you know, which program do I use to spoof my ID? Um, Cause they're out there. It doesn't mean that that is uh, necessarily the case. Um, one thing that has been beneficial, a lot of phone companies now are offering a service for a couple of dollars a month and they will identify the phone numbers as spam. And so if they identify it as spam, uh, then you really don't have to answer those things. If it's a legitimate company, they will leave you a voicemail and you'll be able to move from there. Mike, this has been great. Thank you for taking the time to address our community with your powerful insights into the world of cybersecurity. Um, a lot of challenges, a little scary, and appreciate all your thoughts on it. And uh, we've so enjoyed having you come in and be part of the Dunwoody family and all the support you have for the for the organization and for all your work with veterans is tremendous. So thank you for that. Um, please join us and invite your friends to the next lead speaker series on Thursday, November 5th. We will hear from Kim Randolph, Vice President of Engineering and Construction of Excel Energy and a Dunwoody trustee. And it's another exciting presentation in the LEAD series. So thank you all for being here. Have a great day and a wonderful weekend.